Welcome, everybody. This is another episode of the Africa Podcast. My name is Mikey Mhenna. Today, we have a very special episode with the hosts of Khat Chronicles Season 2. I'm really excited to have this conversation take place. With us, we have Yara Khouri Namur from the American University of Beirut, Yasmin Nashabitan from the Lebanese American University, Fawzi Rahal from Flat Six Labs Beirut, and Huda Smithhausen Abi Faris from the Khat Foundation. Welcome, everyone. It is an honor to have you all here. Panels with more than two people are a uh, a tough <laughs> horse to ride, so I'm going to try my best. Um, uh, Huda, maybe we'll start with you. Let's start with um, the first question, which is from your, you know, from your vantage point as somebody who runs uh, the Khat Foundation and somebody who's, who's sort of spearheading this entire effort, which is uh, fantastic. Why do you think it's important to publish about design from the Arab world, something that you've dedicated a huge part of your career to? Um, from your perspective, why is it so important to do that? Well, I, I really believe that, you know, in this time and age, it's really important to present a sort of global perspective on the history of design. Um, and, you know, in our region, we've been... Uh, under colonial powers or colonial systems for a very long period of time, several colonial, several nations have colonized the region. And so we kind of lost a little bit our um, our image of ourselves. And it's really important to have this to, to publish and to look at our own history and to kind of uh, present uh, this history from the perspective of the people that have, that that should be the makers or that are the makers. Um, in their own voice and in a sort of unmediated manner. I think that, um, you know, having been in, you know, again, under protracted forms of colonialism, I think we have to work hard and as designers to kind of regain our confidence in our values and to kind of be able to create work that we feel is authentic without being nostalgically stuck in the past. So I think that publishing you know, not only publishing, but publishing with a very specific attitude, publishing works about the region, but that also from authors from the region, I think is 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 extremely crucial in my mind. Bozzi, I'm going to wrap you into this question because I think it's uh, interesting. Um, you know, this idea of alternative narratives um, and sort of creating and presenting an alternative narrative. In your mind, you know, how effective is it? You know, how effective do you feel like we have been at presenting and having alternative narratives received um, over the course of your career? Do you feel like um, we're sort of just getting started? Do you feel like there is still so much work to do? Do you feel like students who find out about this stuff are excited about alternative narratives? I would say today and more and more often or more more recently it's become a little bit more challenging to to find a channel to showcase that alternative narrative the al the algorithms are working against uh you know being able to showcase different views for anybody today right i'm, I'm not going to put a um a bit of a, a gloom gloomy uh, outlook on it but it, it doesn't look very bright from a just just from a from an algorithm point of view right you know you you see some things and the algorithm is just going to show you things that are more similar to that. Um, I think I think you and working with you and having uh, the Hot Chronicles uh, in collaboration with Afikra is one way by which uh, we're trying to break through. I know, you know, you, you have a very diverse audience that's interested in various things, and we we're hoping that we you know grab them in and and, and lure them. And we're working in, in multiple ways. And Huda, uh, you know, through our publishing house, has also been trying to I would say break through that noise to kind of showcase a little bit of that. Uh, alternative narrative, but it's not easy at all. Um, you know, just go on search engines or try to research any kind of information about this region. And what you get is not information produced by this region. Is it partly on us? Yes. Um, we're, we don't create a lot of content. There's not a lot of Arabic content in general online. So never mind being on such a specific, you know, not so written or covered uh, kind of topic. Um, I think I think we're trying to do something. I don't want to toot our own horns. Uh, but I think a lot more work needs to be done. Uh, I am positive about it because I think more and more people are curious about a lot more things. Um, you know, even on you know, having TikTok is probably the worst thing that happened to humanity, but maybe we can also use a bit of that algorithm and play with it and, you know, 
start appearing in, in these feeds of people through different ways. Uh, I don't know, sometimes tricking people into seeing things could be, could be a way to, to penetrate and break it into. Yeah. Genocide, worst thing, second worst thing, TikTok. <laughs> Um, I, I want to ask uh, Yara and Yasmin to, maybe in that order, um, both of you are associated with, you know, um, longstanding university graphic design departments and, and you see students every single day. Um, Yara, from your perspective, you know, I'm curious about what the role universities play in presenting these alternative narratives too. I, I I was going to add to Huda and uh, Fauzi that from a perspective of a person who teaches uh, the history of graphic design uh, class, uh, there's I mean we're we're using these platforms in our classes. It's very important to publish again to go back to uh, question number one: publishing uh, about uh, design and designers uh, in the region is important because this is how we prepare material uh, or we make material available accessible to the students and to teachers who teach um, uh, design in the region and are uh, in a way complaining about the lack of material. Uh, there, there it is. It is uh, available in print and now it is available online. Uh, and uh, so I think um, um, I can say that I am uh, using the material and it's important. Uh, and I think what is uh, what is helpful is that the student can go back to it. So, you know, we're, you know, we're sharing the material in class, but the student can uh, you know, go back and listen to the podcast or uh, you know, get the book from the library. So I think we are in a way a building material to be used in classes. Amazing. Um, Huda, I have a question. Mm -hmm. yeah. For those listeners um, who are not familiar with Khat Chronicles, um, how would you describe it to somebody who's not in the world of design, um, maybe not even deeply familiar with the Arab world? What is the sort of the mission or the 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 vision for this podcast. Um, give us an introduction of what this is, podcast is all about. Well, I mean, um, to continue from this idea about you know publishing, I think there's very few publishers uh, specialized on design in the region, and the amount of books don't always reach you know where they're supposed to. So I think. One of the reasons, I mean, one of the, the most important idea behind the Hat Chronicles podcast was to kind of supplement that and to kind of create material that is educational, but kind, but at the same time, informal, accessible, there for everyone. And in a way to kind of, you know, open up the appetites of people that randomly come across it. Um, and like Fauzi said, you know, being associated with Africa really helps that. Um, to kind of want to learn more about, go deeper into the knowledge about the history. Um, the other thing I think that when we started, you know, with this idea of making the podcast was to think about um, how this how this this material is different from, let's say, a book. And we kind of really wanted to focus and introduce uh, mid career or early career designers that were not too young but too young to have a you know a monograph and a history written about them because they are just you know launching themselves but still at the same time people that had enough experience and enough vision and a remarkable way of working and something unique so that they would be a kind of source of inspiration for the younger generations and maybe in you know 10 years we would make a book about them if they continued on the right path yeah. so to speak so I think, you know, the idea is to present really stories and to also, like I said in the beginning, to listen to the narrative from the perspective of the makers and not be telling, you know, on their behalf, because there is, we've always been told on our behalf about our culture. And this is the time where we want to tell ourselves the stories, imperfect or informal as they may be. So yes. this is a bit the vision of... of what what makes this podcast different than let's say a book or yeah and it's it's super approachable so there you know there are these long uh long form conversations with as you said the makers um and it gives a sense um of some background Fauzi, did you want to chime in yeah i wanted to say that part of the the, the joy that uh, comes with uh, you know listening to the podcast as a designer or as someone who's passionate about design is that it helps, it works a bit like a support group. Uh, designers face a lot of similar challenges 
uh, early on in their careers and they think they're alone, right? And listening to somebody else's story who someone else has, you know, made it or is, is actually making a difference, uh, you know, to talk a bit and, 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 you know, give you a little bit of their uh, version of the story that kind of overlaps with yours in so many similar ways could be quite inspirational and can kind of give you a little bit more of a lead or of a, of a role model that you can, you know, learn more about, you know, look into and, uh, and be encouraged by. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, Yara, you're back, which is great. Um, let me ask you as an educator, um, how does having this like resource of these types of conversations help you um, with your students? You know, how does it actually serve as a, a support or a buttress when you're actually trying to speak to freshmen, sophomores, uh, juniors, seniors, or even recently graduated students? I mean, this is a perfect example of how we use it. Uh, we use these podcasts and these books. Um, we, I'm just teaching type one, and we're, uh, uh, which is the introduction to typography. And we, we've always given like 10 years ago, resources for students from Jan Cold to all of these um, um, European, North American designers to look into. And we've never had a name in mind and we are always struggling. One name, one Arab person, one person that can actually, uh, 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 people can find resources on or students can find resources on. And now we do, we have it and we can give it to them and say, listen to this podcast, read these books. I mean, uh, uh, starting with the Khat uh, books and then came the podcast. And now we have a, a whole history of Arab graphic design. And this is just a starting point. And um, I think the future of these publications in whatever form they are in, and whether they're in podcasts or books, it is, I see them in the future. What would they give as an impact? And not now. I mean, now, yes, we use them, but I see that they might be used in a different form and be read in a different way in the future. And maybe people and designers and um, and theorists and researchers would look and say, oh, there is a recognizable movement or a recognizable pattern in these designers that were talking about that particular time and how they did things and why did the things they make look that way so i think you know it's not the immediate effect i'm i'm really interested uh, i hope i live it long enough to see the effect of all of that accumulated knowledge what would it actually be and would we find patterns in what we're talking about now because now we're in the middle of it and we you can't have a, a bird's eye view as much uh, uh, and a lot of, uh, of changes and a lot of designers are working and, and producing a lot. So I think uh, it, it will be much more interesting to look at it in the future now. <laughs> yeah. Yasmin, from your perspective, um, Ohuda, you wanted to add something? Go for it. Yeah, I wanted to add something to, to Yadas. I think what, is, what I find also important in a podcast is that you you are not looking because you always see design as a sort of final you only see the final work, you know, the final outcome. And you have maybe a critic's point of view about it. But when you listen through the stories of the designers, the makers, and how they get somewhere and how they develop their practice, you have a um, you have a deeper knowledge, you have a deeper appreciation and understanding. And maybe it also, like Fauzi said, it gives you confidence as a designer, as a young designer, that you may be going through this process or this could be a progress of how your your work will eventually you become somewhere you know you become a designer fully um, developed in your work but how how the process goes and and some of it is accidental some of it is funny some of it is like coincidences in life and that i think is really an important story for young designers to learn whereas when you see a book or an article or an essay it's just very final, very formal, and, and sometimes very intimidating as well for somebody young. That's all I wanted. Yeah, for sure, Fauzi. Um, I, I wanted to jump in and like, I, I know Yara took us to the future and uh, kind of made us a little bit of a time capsule for uh, all, all things design and knowledge. But even on a, like on a today on a contemporary level, I think it also provides a platform for all of these designers that are being featured, um, you know, to actually do additional work or opportunities for collaboration uh, or for people to actually look them up and, uh, you know, learn a bit more about them before they hire them or before they uh, they work with them is, is quite important. And I think and I want to bring up 
uh, you know, Huda's efforts uh, originally and the Khat Foundation's efforts in doing a lot of typographic matchmaking between up and coming, uh, you know, Arabic type designers uh, and quite known, uh, you know, foreign Western um, established uh, type designers to, to, to from one side create, uh, you know, Arabic alternatives to these Western uh, versions of the uh, or Latin versions of the fonts, but to also, you know, provide a little bit more of exposure to these designers and, you know, have a little bit something more featured in their portfolio. Yeah, Yara, I think you wanted to say something as well. I, I wanted to give an example, actually. If, if, yeah, if go I for mean, it. Go for uh, it. Yeah, please. We, we, for example, I will go back to the, I will go back to the future idea. <laughs> that, for example, it, when you interview somebody like Karim Farah, who is not a very young, he's medium uh, in his mid career designer. Um, we get to listen to him, but I'm looking at the future that somebody would actually, after, after a whole career of design with Karim Farah, I mean, in 20 years' time, people would start with this podcast as a reference. And that is what he was doing at that time, at that particular, in that particular context. And it would be an, a very valuable resource in terms of a podcast. He was, uh, he, he's live, he's talking, he's saying these things. It's not somebody said about him, and that is where his work was published. It's a, a, it's a live and sure reference the podcast for future generations to look at also, because he said it, <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's not, yeah. and I know that because I, when I did uh, the uh, Nasri Khattar book with uh, Huda, uh, I mean, the, the, the Nasri Khattar was not alive uh, when we were doing the book and uh, the research was all about digging deeper and asking people around him. So now we have these references that are live. They are, are recorded he they they are saying these things not you and not somebody who wrote about them later on in other resources so this is the only thing i wanted to add about that idea yeah i agree i mean i think you 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 hit it on this on the dot you know on the on the nail on the head whatever the expression is i think it's like what we lack always especially in design is is reliable information and archiving because you know with fine arts it's very precious work whereas design is very vernacular it's everywhere it's not precious as an as objects and so nobody documents it and nobody really writes much about it or if they write they don't write about the design or it's always in you know behind the back of the makers so i think in term it what what yada said is really important it's really important to have these archives as you know from the makers because then it makes research in the future much better, uh, much more accurate, and it, it, it will help, you know, to grow a bit more of a, um, a scholarly writing on, on design, which we really, really need, I think. Yeah, we're trying to make future resor- researchers' lives easier. So if you're listening from the future, you're welcome. Um, Yasmin, I want to ask you about, let's go back to the past for a second. Um, you know, how important is it to teach your students about the sort of the pioneers of older generations? Um, In addition to introducing them to their contemporary peers, how important is it to sort of introduce these these giants who oftentimes, whose work is sort of um, conspicuously miss uh, uh, unattributed to them and their their impact isn't always uh, fully felt? or fully recognized, I should say. So yeah, tell us a little bit about that. I think it's very important to tell students about design, tell stories about students, uh, tell students about designers who, from the past, uh, uh, who worked within their own culture. Um, I think that bringing up uh, uh, designers who produced work in the past is like uh, is a bit like uh, uh, building history uh, about a certain culture. So we're bringing in cultural uh, stories, uh, stories about uh, uh, our culture. Uh, I wanted to say that uh, I am now teaching a class, a first year student class, where I have students from different design disciplines. So they're not only graphic designers, but industrial designers, architects, and you name it. And when I bring uh, brought up these uh, uh, podcasts, they said to me, we didn't know that there were designers in 
the Arab world, in Syria, in Iraq, in, you know, and, you know, like, I think that this is, and, and I think we have this idea in mind because of the concept of modernity and design being more of a modern um, field and that we are more traditional uh, in our culture and, and, and uh, to brought up a very interesting discussion in class. Uh, so this is about the past designers, the designers, young designers who are working now, I think it's good to speak about them or to listen to them because it makes designers who are working today feel that they are not, not working in a vacuum, that they are working collectively on building something that they, you know, that this idea was and it started with this designer and it can continue with another designer or, you know, like I think there's a certain uh, collective way of thinking about design when we listen to these designers and the way they produce work uh, and, you know, the, 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 the way they talk about their practice. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's, it's, it's crazy vital. Yada, I'm going to put you on the spot as well. Cause I'm, I'm curious about, um, what you know you're talking about you're, you're teaching type one um who are some of the names that your your students are like amazed that they've never even heard of like who are some of these giants that somebody listening to this podcast might be interested in, in um checking out i mean um when they're in in type one, they're in first or se in their third semester. So it means that um, they haven't heard about many <laughs> designers yet. So uh, I think uh, we're starting from the protagonists, uh, El Labad and Halmi Tuni and uh, uh, some other designers from Iraq, from Syria. Yeah, from her, and they don't know, as Yasmin was saying, they don't know that they exist. Uh, they don't know that we have designers. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, they're too young to hear about anyone at this stage. Uh, may I ask, I ask, yeah, Yasmin, please go ahead. I really need to add a female name on Lara's list of male designers. <laughs> it's also this. I mean, this is also another discussion in class where students are like, oh, yeah, there are no female designers in the Arab world. Of course, there are female designers who work not only in typography, but also in calligraphy and, you know, and design. And so, yeah, that's also the importance of the podcast that is being uh, uh, treating uh, women and men equally. <laughs> I want to add something actually. And um, our understanding of designers also is very new, relatively new. So um, when you're talking about uh, designers from the region, they're not recognized as designers. They are, I think they are now recognized as designers, but when they were working in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, they were designing because they were artists or doing something else. And so they weren't coined as designers. So that is something also uh, an effort that we have to put uh, uh, in telling them, no, they were actually designing book covers. They were actually designing typefaces or they were designing uh, magazines and newspapers and they were doing design entre cote, uh, entre, uh, entre, yeah, in quotations. So yeah. uh, without them knowing. So they were artists or that came from different backgrounds and they became designers so when we give western or north european they knew they were designing they were coined as designers or graphic designers or letter designers or or illustrators uh, here they weren't i don't think i uh, correct me if i'm wrong Huda or yasmin or fauzi if they are they they were not aware of the design impact they were producing at, at the time. So we didn't understand that they were actually um, designers <laughs> in the sense that- Because it wasn't a term that they used, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I wanna add, add to what you're saying, Yara, not only like by, by researching today and trying to find designers of that time, would you not be able to because you're using the wrong keyword or because they weren't really you know, recognized as designers. Uh, a lot of them, you know, these are the lucky ones that you can find, a lot of them, you know, just because they were designers, and they're not really artists. They're not portraying their work at a, at a you know, a, at a gallery. They're they're just doing functional things, whether it's a book or a poster or a piece of art or a flyer. Um, their names are not there, and you don't even know until today. We don't know who, who made them. They're anonymous people because they were just commissioned to do a job. Um, so a lot of that history is already lost, and I, I think it's important to try to document whatever is left out of you know the remaining part. Yeah. 
Okay, I, I want think to it's this. also the profession in general. I mean, the graphic design profession in general is quite 1950s, not before, all around the world. But that doesn't mean that graphic design was not practiced. It was just not recognized as such. They were artists. An artist could paint, but could also design a book, could work with a printer. Um, I think what we, what I find interesting also, I want to add one point to your question and let you move on, is this idea that um, you know, what, what do you learn from that? I think what you learn not only about how, how they looked at their, you know, um, how they practiced design without even calling it design. And you learn how maybe some of the things that they were dealing with could be applied to today as a designer. So I think you learn from their experiences and you learn that, you know, that even within, within their own kind of limited, um, uh, let's say, um, technological capability or technology, technology, they still had really very, um, very complex networks. So they work together. I think something we learned from that generation is they all work together towards a purpose that is bigger than the actual making of the object. So they all had this, like, they were on a mission. And maybe it was not always, it's not always necessary for all design, but I think in today's world, I think we need to bring back that, that feeling of design as a mission to society and the network and collaboration between designers is really important. Yeah. So I want to ask you a question about this. Obviously I, as somebody who runs Afikra, I'm deeply concerned with the idea of community and, and networks. Um, and Khat obviously is as well. Um, yeah. But Huda, I want to ask you a question and then I want to kind of open it up because this here, we have a network, right? We have four people um, in different houses and working on different things, all uh, collaborating. But do you feel like Khat's work and specifically Khat Chronicles is forging networks and partnerships or revealing partnerships and networks that are already there and sort of putting them in plain sight for listeners and students and future designers to see? I think it's both. I think somehow, um, you know, it's it's actually both. I think it's revealing the networks and revealing, for example, when we interview people, they always reference older people that inspired them. And before you know it, you start to see that they actually know the same people if they don't even know each other or studied in the same place. Um, but you also, but by listening to this, you kind of create networks. So people can always listen to a podcast and say, oh, who is this Hatim Imam? And then, of course, today you can go and Google, you can Google their name, you can find their Instagram account. All of a sudden, you know their whole life story. So I think, um, or at least the life story they want to present to the world <laughs> if they are smart. Yeah. So I mean, I think that in a way, I think networking is important. It's also this idea that I think we all share this feeling that today we have to collaborate because together we can be a, a force, a voice that puts, you know, puts ourselves in, you know, we don't need to constantly compare ourselves to the West anymore. We can look at ourselves, exchange ideas and create our own community with, 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 with the possibility of going further. And if the West learns from it, great. If they don't, it doesn't matter. It's not important. I think I, I feel like when, 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 with the possibilities today on networks, you have the possibility of, of finding what other people are doing, but it's so humongous. And having a more focused point, whether it's uh, the Khat Foundation or whether it's Afikra or whether it's the Khat Chronicles, then you know where to go to get a certain a certain perspective or a certain group of people that you're not lost in the kind of like immense amount of information. Yeah. Um, and I think that collaboration is really important. It's, we, we're beyond, you know, like I'm the hero, I do everything myself. And, you know, yeah. the, the Renaissance men are kind of outdated, I think. Yeah. Yara, I want to ask you a question. You alluded to a book that you were working on earlier um, and researching, and you alluded to the fact that you and Hudu were working on it together. Right. Mm -hmm. was I mean, right yes. That? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, I was working on it with Huda as a publisher. The, yeah. So even in, even in that in that uh, even in that sort of collaboration, even sort of mm -hmm. researcher publisher collaboration, I'm curious about what um, 
what role collaboration and networks play in actual in the in the research function, not only in the sort of we're you know I need a I need a, a extra typographer on this project I'm working on, or I need this person to help me understand this. Like when it comes to actually research, um, how what role do these networks actually play in deepening research, improving research, and broadening research? Maybe Huda can actually answer this question. I mean, uh, um, networks happen by coincidence also and by personal effort. You know, these networks are built by curiosity, by looking, meeting the people. And I remember the first time I met Huda. I've heard of uh, Huda. Uh, she was my hero for writing the book Arabic Typography, which I used it was my first book. It was like a, <laughs> I used in classroom. I, it was too late for me. It was uh, I, I had already graduated, but I was like, I wish I had that book when I graduated. But, but so was it a coincidence, Yara? Her... Was it because Yara? Sorry to interrupt you. Was it a coincidence, or was it because again, not to toot our horn, but it was the only resource available about Arabic typography that was ever made? It was the only resource, and of course, it was the only resource. But also, I think it's about projecting what you want. So, so I think when you, you when you we look at it, what happened twenty five years ago, maybe when we first met, or twenty years ago, uh, when we first met, uh, it was, it we had to find each other. These networks happened at that time because we were so few, and now with social media around, it's much easier to uh, to uh, for designers to pop on your radar, for uh, collectives to pop on your radar, or for uh, labs, type labs, and uh, and research labs, and people doing super interesting stuff. And I think this is one of the ways that, that we pick uh, the designers. Uh, when we were picking in our first round of Khat, it was not through social media. It was through our uh, own knowledge of the people around us and what people have told us. But now it's much easier because the the the, the compass has widened uh, because of social media and the links between one and the other and those collaborations. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. If 20 I, years ago, if you I'm, couldn't you couldn't look up Huda on Instagram and see her entire life. Sadly. No, I, I remember <laughs> when I was doing my MA, my colleague was in emailing Huda. She she got an email address and she was like, hallelujah, I got an email address, but Huda never replied. So you cannot, <laughs> but so you, you cannot actually reach Huda if the email either reply either was there, it, it, she received it or or she didn't reply because she didn't have time. So that was the only way to reach Huda. But now you can be hunted down, you know, from Instagram, from Facebook, from a phone call, from an email, from three emails you have around. So uh, it's much easier to collaborate, I would say. And Amazing. now from a podcast and YouTube as well, Yara, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And now when people contact you, you can also check them out before you actually answer because you think, oh, are they going to exactly. waste my time or are they worth answering? Or before you don't answer, Huda, right? Okay. <laughs> no, I always answer my email. <laughs> but sometimes it takes years, you know. <laughs> yeah. Fauzi, were you going to say something as well? Uh, no, not really. I think they, they kind of, uh, uh, um, I think Yara kind of elaborated a lot exactly yeah. on what I wanted to say. They covered it. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Yasmin, I want to start with you. I want to ask you, uh, before we move on to talking about season two, maybe you can uh, talk a little bit about, um, maybe I'll go down the list of everybody and see um, on season one, um, you know, if you had a favorite episode or recommend an episode that people go back to before we talk about what's coming on season uh, season two. That's a difficult question because uh, most of the podcasts were really, each one of them has something interesting in it. I mean, uh, Huda just mentioned Hatim Imam. I really like Hatim Imam's uh, podcast. Um, I did Joanne Baz. I thought it was an interesting discussion. Um, okay, don't pick all of them. You can, because uh, everyone <laughs> else has to pick one. Too. Tell us about Joanne Baz. Uh, um, what, what do you remember from that that might be interesting for people to look into? It was one of the first ones, and uh, I, I, I think, and uh, uh, she was uh, uh, one of the interviewees that was very easy to interview because she was very, uh, uh, she improvised in a way, you know, like she was, she spoke from the heart. Um, uh, um, 
Yeah, no, I yeah, I thought it was a good one. She's an illustrator. She spoke mostly about her illustration work and her design. Uh, I'm not going to repeat what she said in the okay. podcast, so cool. I'll let you watch it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Let's do it in this order. Fauzi, how about you go? And then Yara, then Huda, I'll let you go last. I would say, uh, I would say Jana Trabulsi. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, she's a goofy, amazing character, so it's always a fun thing to listen to her. For somebody who doesn't know Jana, what does she do exactly? So uh, I think Jana is an illustrator as well, in addition to other things, but she Great. like particularly is an illustrator. Okay, awesome. Yada, what about you? Um, I think I will have to fall on Lena Gaibi's uh, uh, interview. I had um, I had just started at AUB and I didn't know her very well, but she had an amazing life. She traveled all around. She's been she is half Syrian, half Lebanese. Then she went to Yemen and then she went to Egypt and then she came back to Lebanon. And she she has such a rich life uh, and a cultural background and baggage that she talked about in that interview. And uh, that actually tells you exactly why she is where she is now. Lina Raibi is an illustrator, a comics artist, and a, a graphic uh, novelist. And she is the head of the uh, 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 the initiative for Arab uh, uh, comics in uh, at AUB. Oh. Yeah. initiative. Archive. Mm. for comics book. Amazing. Yeah. So I think this this was really interesting. <laughs> cool. Hoda, what about you? I can't decide. I, I really, I, the only thing I can say is that, you know, I really personally enjoy talking to, uh, to the people I talk to and to listen to them afterwards was really nice to have like that distance of time and then listen to the podcast one more time. I found... Um, it's not my favorite necessarily, but I think it's also a very unique uh, episode with uh, um, the two women, one designer, Syrian, and one um, from South Africa, and how they met in Amsterdam, and then they started to collaborate together, and they work sort of on the edge of, of uh, design. So they use design language to create more narratives about archiving and feminist uh, archiving and feminist work and looking at, you know, problems of social problems of refugees, of, you know, people that have gone through trauma. So using design as tool to create a work that is thought provoking, um, that is Foundland Collective. You know? Yeah, and they're amazing. They, they, it's just the conversation with them could have gone on for like a week i would have loved to keep on talking to them and so i think but then you know we captured that that spirit in 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 the episode and i think it's a very very interesting episode for me because it presents design outside of the confines of what we expect graphic design to be um so that was sort of an interesting addition cool but yeah i love all of them actually i don't think we've had a really terrible episode with anybody they were all like, really <laughs> fun to talk to and had really cool things to say yeah um yada did you want to say something go for it yes i wanted i wanted to say that i'm amazed that huda can listen to the podcast after they are uh, uh recorded i could never listen to my own voice or my own i would never watch a YouTube again of me saying something. I just shy away. So I don't know if anyone else shares with me that phobia, maybe, or that anxiety. Yeah, yeah. I, I relate to you, trust me. I um, think it's good to put some distance. Like I wouldn't be able to listen to it right after, but after, you know, a few months, then it's like new because I've already forgotten everything that's been said. Right, Yara, you might surprise yourself. <laughs> yeah. you Yara, let me give you, let me give you a... intelligent. I'll give you a pro tip. You want me to tell you a pro tip? Listen to yourself at 2x. It's like a whole different person. Oh, no. <laughs> um, you you alluded to the fact that for season two, um, you didn't just, you know, go on Instagram and find people who had, you know, pretty profiles. Um, talk to us a little bit, Huda, let's start with you. Talk to us a little bit about the curation for the episodes for season two. <clears throat> Oh God, we we kind of, you know, we, we continued this process from the start. We kind of come together and just throw names out and uh, and then just kind of 
try to make sure that they don't that they are geographically diverse that they have also the way they work is different and everyone makes a case for the designers they are proposing and then we kind of you know decided each one to adopt one of them and work with them um i think that the list is growing and i think that it's kind of growing organically so we're not going to say like this season we're going to focus only on this type of thing because that's not really interesting but to kind of also keep that informality of like randomly picking designers, of course, not randomly as such, but you know, they're all they're all really worth talking to. Um, some of them, I think, we've known about or known of their work or have met, you know, through the through occasion, one occasion or another. So we have a little bit of background information. And then, uh, you know, the people we don't know very well, we decided still if there are interesting work that we do some research and that we meet with them. So we've been doing kind of a process of getting to know them a little bit better before we actually hold uh, the, the conversation. Um, I, I, I guess yeah. that's all I have to say. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, in general, I mean, like what... What do we have in store? How many episodes do we have coming up? Um, and is it following the same format um, in terms of long form conversations? Yeah, I think we we will keep the long form conversation. And I think we found also that, you know, doing one episode per month is good. We don't want to bombard people and we want to take the time to actually do our research and, and conversation with them properly. Uh, I think also this this season we decided to actually put the podcast online and kind of show a few slides of the work so that it's kind of you know a little bit visual not too visual because i think you can look at their work also on instagram and find them but it just gives a little bit context to the conversation because we are talking sometimes discussing specific projects and it would be just really nice to see what that project is about um, yeah more or less you know um Fauzi, let me ask you a question, and I'm curious uh, everyone's answers, but maybe I'll start with you, Fauzi. Um, are all the people that you're interviewing people that you were like very intimately familiar with in terms of their work, or are you discovering them along with the listener? Um, I don't think you know we we would bring in or 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 have somebody come in that we don't we're not familiar with, or we haven't seen some of their work before, or you know have somehow interacted with them historically. Yeah. Um, and, and we also don't accept applications. This is a, like an invitation only kind of thing where sure. you have to like have your work out. And then, you know, if it gets, if we look at it and it's interesting, or if we find that, you know, sometimes you, know, you can have really great work, but you're just not a good storyteller. Uh, or, you, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of criteria that, that would require you to be able to, you know, to be on a, on a show. And I think you know that better than us, Mikey. Yeah, you can get you can get amazing people who just you know don't really think of their work that highly, and therefore will just not tell you a lot of things. Um, and and so there's a lot of uh, you know back and forth. You know, we try to see if there's any other place where where they've spoken. Um, sometimes uh, Huda would just you know find through her network a way to reach out to them and then put put one of us in touch, and then we take it from there. Uh, but I would say for the first episode, we, we we originally or at least the initial episodes, we did them in a very you know, intimate space, uh, you know, we, we, we sat down in a, 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 a makeshift studio room and we invited a few people over and we did it over face to face. I think we decided for uh, season two to, you know, extend the borders and, and reach and not just find an opportunity where somebody is in town so that we can interview them. And just, you know, given that Zoom kind of broke uh, the borders, we're, we're going to do a lot more of that as well. That's cool. Um, all right. So, what I'd like to do now is we're going to wrap up by doing a little bit of a rapid fire um, mm -hmm. round of questions. And so I shared these questions with all of you beforehand. And so I think you're relatively prepared. We'll do them um, in the order I see. Uh, we'll do reverse uh, alphabetical order. We'll do Yara, Yasmin, Fauzi. Um, oh, Huda, then Fauzi. I think that's reverse mm -hmm. alphabetical order. Um, okay. So the first question is uh yada what is one artist or designer from the past that everyone listening should google right now if you can say their full name and if uh give a little context about who the person is um i thought a lot about this question and i don't have one artist or designer that one should google right now <laughs> to be honest i mean it's very hard but 
what what actually the book from Bahia and uh, and uh, uh, Haysam uh, did uh, Haysam did uh, is actually um, reveal a lot of unknown uh, the unknown soldier. There are lots of unknown designers, and that's what I would like designers to actually Google. Try to find who did what, because now we know some of the designers and what they're doing and what they did before. But I think if one wants to Google something, uh, trace some of the work. That's what I would like uh, uh, designers to do and artists and upcoming future designers to do. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna still put you on the spot. Hold on, you're not gonna get out of this question. I want to put you on the spot. When you were back, when you were a student, was there one designer that you came across that you were like, oh my God, they're so amazing. They're so incredible. Yes, of course, of course, of course. I mean, um, um, Reza Abedini for, for me was like my... It was like my go-to uh, oh. on every single occasion. Uh, his work is amazing. He had the website on and uh, I would like just sit in front of that website and look at the work uh, hours on end. If, okay. that's, if that answers your question. That answers my question. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, Mean. Um, I would say Salwa Raudashir. <clears throat> Salwa Raudashir is well known as a sculptor and a painter, an abstract painter, but she is also a designer. By that, I mean that she designed several uh, covers for books. Uh, she designed, I can say, a kind of a typeface, started designing a, a, a font. Uh, uh, we have uh, parts of her uh, letters cast in, in, in wood or lino cut. Um, she is she works uh, with uh, uh, Islamic motifs, but at the same modern. She is a Sufi, but at the same uh, 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 very much uh, interested in Islamic uh, culture. Um, and uh, and not everything will be on Google. There's a book that is published by Khat for the information about her as a designer. So the Google will say will give you all the information about her as an artist, as a painter, as a sculptor. But there's a lot to learn about her and not okay. everything is on Google. <laughs> but hopefully they'll be able to buy the book on Google, at least. Okay, that's great. Fauzi, you're, uh, Huda, you're next. Okay, that's um, it's a very difficult question. Like I think the way you asked it to Yara made me think twice. Like I think when I first thought about this question, I thought, okay, who is the person you should know as an Arab designer. Like he is the first kind of Arab designer, big, big name Arab designer. And that's of course, uh, Mohideen al uh, But I didn't know him when I was studying. So my hero was actually April Griman, which is uh, a woman designer from California who is, I met her in later life and she is just as fantastic as her work. Um, so she's she continues to be a, in many ways an inspiration to me, but she's not an Arab and she does not represent Arab culture. And I learned about Mahidin Labad later when I really started to teach. I think I think everything I learned about Arab design, graphic design, was when I started to teach because then I had to dig and research and find out information so I can be relevant. And, and to me, Mohideen Labad represents this, not only, he was very prolific as a, as a designer, he was also an illustrator, he had a lot of strong opinions. He was like a true design activist, and he was an inspiration to a lot of people. And his work is really strong, and, and he worked in different fields and with different people. So if you're going to name one like iconic Arab graphic designer, then Mohideen come, Mohideen comes first. Okay. And um, there are books about him that he made himself, which is, I think, also, again, he was unique because a lot of designers don't write about themselves or they don't write their thoughts. And he was unique in that sense. So he's like a great archivist himself. So, yeah. So he's he's, um, cool. he's my second hero. Yeah. My hero. <laughs> um, There's Fauzi, many more, but we're not going to talk about it. Yeah. Fauzi, what about you? Who are you going to add to the list? Um, I'll, I'll first start by telling you that also uh, growing up as a designer, the only designer Arab designers I had heard of or read about were the ones that Huda taught me. Uh, otherwise, it was also not that easy. It was, you know, to Google them or to, to kind of look them up. Also quite tough, I would say, again, uh, Mahideen Labad, if we're talking about, you know, a recognizable 
like someone that you should really know about their work and, and look into. But there's a lot more. I'll, I'll add a female name. I'll say Madiha Omar. Although again, if you look her up online, she's one of those that will also be known as an artist or whatever. There's very little about her design, maybe experience uh, that's online, but try, try, to, try to dig in and, and see a lot of her work. It's very interesting. Cool. Amazing. Okay. Uh, the last rapid fire question is, um, Yada, I think you kind of gave your answer away, but I'll, I'll have you uh, take another shot at it. So what book do you think that every design student in the Arab world should read, study, and explore? Yada, you can go ahead, then Yasmin, then I'll have Fauzi, then Huda, I'll let you wrap us up at the end. Thank you, thank you. I was thinking about that a lot, and this is what I got with me. And thank you, Huda, for saying Wahidin Labad, because actually, it's exactly how you said it. We learned about him much later. So uh, on in our careers and in our lives as designers. So this is my go-to book, which is uh, Nazar. Uh, uh, it's a compilation of the four uh, bo- um, like booklets or books that uh, or albums, as he call it, uh, calls it in one book that uh, Nazar one zero one two three and four uh, one two three four. And um, I still eat my fingers, Nadam, because I was invited to Nazar four with Mahiddin al Labad, and I just didn't make it happen. And I am really like, really, really like I was, I should have been with him. I should have been there. Uh, this is a valuable book that, uh, as uh, as Huda said, uh, Mahideen is very prolific. And he actually in- introduced me to the idea that designers write about design in the Arab world. So this was the first time I saw somebody writing about our own culture and he saw our own culture and everything we see around us as designed items. And he opened my mind to that, that don't take it for granted that these things look like that. They have a history and this is where it comes from, explained in a beautiful way. So I think this is my go-to book. Um, and that's it. <laughs> Amazing. And the the earlier book that you're referring to is a history of Arabic graphic design by, by Bahia Shahab and Haysam, what's his um, last name? Haysam Nawar. 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 Okay, perfect. Um, Yasmin, what about you? Okay, so I, you gave us the questions earlier, and I prepared, like I thought this the my the first book that I thought about was Labad's book as well. But I don't want it to sound like Mahideen Labad is the only designer that we can remember. So yeah, so it's Kashkul. He has this other uh, series of books, uh, and Kashkul is. This book that he made uh, where he uh, addresses uh, visual, this book in Arabic about visual culture. And uh, in the book, he has uh, several uh, pages where he speaks about the nuances between communicating in Arabic and commu- visually communicating in, in English. And I thought I used this book in my class. Um, the book is translated to more than 70 languages, the, the Skashkul book that uh, Labad designed. But yeah, so <laughs> and designed and wrote. So yeah, so Mahdeen al Labad. Okay, cool. Um, Fauzi? I would say if you uh, haven't, First of all, read the Arabic typography book that Huda put together. Um, you should. It kind of takes you through the entire history of Arabic typography. And I think it's one of the best documented uh, you know, books out there that does it. Uh, and uh, also to, to, to kind of also push another uh, cut book, I think one of my favorites has always been the typographic matchmaking book. Uh, that kind of shows the you know step by step sketches and process by which you know typefaces were made, and it's very interesting to see the birth of you know uh, you know fonts and in, in, in like in a book in front of you. Sorry, a lot of nerdy talk about typography. no, that's amazing. Um, okay, Huda, you can't pick your own book anymore. You have to pick a different one. Okay, I pick uh, the next best one. Uh, <laughs> It's a big fat book, big bad book, as they call it, like the the Bible of Arabic. It's a, it's a book called Arabic Type Specimen Book, and it shows all the existing fonts in Arabic that have ever been made in the digital in a digital form, um, and it shows all you know the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the very good. Um, and this book is going to be also there will be a second edition of it where 
only the good will be shown this time. But it was made at a time when, you know, you didn't have any any way of seeing, you know, differences between typefaces or what was available, who was doing what. So it's really a very good book. It's like a, an immense document. Some of these, um, so it was published, I think, in 2003, I think, I'm not sure. Um, and at that time, um, some of the people that had found, that had published fonts, these foundries, uh, don't exist anymore. So it's quite become like a like an archive of what has been and and who made what. Um, and the new edition will be coming soon. It will be great also because all of a sudden you realize that um, like there's there's a lot more innovation in type design since uh, since 2000 you know since the past 10 years let's say and there's a lot more young people starting their own foundries and making like really interesting authentic work where they look at inspiration from older uh, from older um, scripts from their environment fun you know, free, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's going to be a fantastic book when it's out. So it's that one book. And I have one more book I want to say that will be coming out, which I think is really important because we talked around the subject a bit. It's a, a book on women designers from the Swana region. This is in progress. And uh, please, you know, for those of you that are interested, I think you should have it. Um, and it will, you know, so just keep on on Instagram and just check out when it's ready. Hopefully end of this year. Amazing. So, um, and we'll put is, in the, in the description of this, uh, of this video and in the podcast description, uh, the Khat website where you can find all the books that are put out, um, via Khat. Well, let me just say on, on my behalf, it is an honor that we're doing this collaboration with you guys. I'm a huge fan, obviously of, of the work that you do. Um, and I'm thrilled that we're doing season two. It's so exciting. Thank you. Thank we're you. also Thank looking you. forward to, con to continuing collaborating with you and we really enjoy it. And I mean, I, the first time I saw Afikra Way before I, we even thought of the podcast, I thought, oh, I love this. I love this. It's such a great program. <laughs> it's such a, it's so fun to listen to it also. So you were also a source of inspiration, at least to me. I don't Amazing. know about the rest, but, uh, and we met. Somehow, yeah. eventually, <laughs> like like Yada said, you always meant to meet some people eventually. And eventually, um, you get to meet everybody. Um, Yasmin, Yada, Fauzi, Hoda, thanks so much. Um, please, Thank if you. you're listening, please look up um, the Chat Chronicles on everywhere you find podcasts. So you can find it on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and Echami, uh Stitcher, all that stuff subscribe now so that you can be ready for season two catch up on some of those old episodes and we will see you in the next episode thanks Thank so you. much everybody thank you mikey bye-bye <laughs>